Amen. Well, you may be seated. Good morning, church. Good morning, family of God. You are loved uh, in this place. And um, I pray that now God would do that thing which only the Lord can do um, by the power of his spirit, where he takes his word and he just breathes life and power and truth and he speaks directly to our hearts. So let it be. If you've got a Bible, why don't you take it out and meet me in the book of Ephesians chapter 6. In Ephesians chapter 6. And um, you may realize, hey, we've been on this paragraph for a couple months now, which is true. Uh, but we actually uh, took a little month-long break for Easter and Palm Sunday and stuff like that. And today we are going to finish, we're going to finish the armor of God. So he's got a great, he's got a great message for us. So let's, um, can we pray? And then we're going to dive in, all right? Oh, Father, it's, it's your breath in our lungs, and so we pour out our praise. God, you say that your word is the very breath of God, and I pray that you'd breathe all over us today. Father, as we, um, as we listen to you, as we open our ears and open our hearts, would you take your words Allow me to fade. Allow your truth to be planted deep. Um, allow kingdom fruit to just bloom and grow. And I pray that I would fade. I pray that you would shine. I pray that, um, I pray as we go to the battlefield again and expose uh, the very strategy of the enemy. I'm just so, um, I'm so aware of how angry that would make the enemy. And so right now, I claim the power of the blood of Jesus Christ over this room. I just pray protection. Um, I pray that our minds and our hearts would be shielded um, and open to hear from you, oh God. So Holy Spirit, do what only you can do. Take over the room. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Uh, there was a European theologian, his name was Oscar Coleman, and he once said this, I think it's very profound. He said that as Christians, we live between God's D-Day and God's V-E-Day. That make sense to you? Can I, can I unpack that just a little bit? Um, V-E-Day, which was called Victory in Europe Day, was June 6th, 1944. Okay, here's what happened. There was an unconditional surrender by Nazi Germany, and basically the world celebrated uh, the war is done. World War II is over. But that's not the day that the war was won. Do you realize that? The war was won 336 days earlier. Let me give you the exact date. It was June 6, 1944, D-Day, uh, which was the day, I've been studying this and reading about this lately, D-Day, when the Allied troops stormed the beaches of Normandy, okay? On D-Day, uh, literally, um, it was once called, I didn't know this, it was called Operation Sledgehammer, okay? 156,000 troops came into Normandy. Almost 7,000 ships, 2,000 aircrafts, 867 gliders, um, my grandfather was a medic on one of the ships, all right? And they showed up on D-Day knowing that if they could take that beach, if they could cut a path to Paris, that they would divide the enemy in half and they would win the war. The war was won, although for the next 336 days, like, there was still some cleaning up to do. Like, the enemy wasn't going out without a fight, and so there was... There was concentration camps with captives to be set free still. Uh, there was like casualties that still happened. There was a cleanup war to happen, but the victory was done and they were in between until the victory was celebrated, okay? And we as followers of Jesus, we kind of live in that in between. We live, I hope you know this, uh, that Jesus, when he died on the cross and rose from the grave and ascended to heaven and reigns and rules, it's like the victory has been won, okay? We can proclaim a victory. We don't fight for victory. We fight from a victory, but we're still waiting until the final day when Jesus comes again and the victory is celebrated. Um, 
and there's captives to be set free, and there's casualties that will happen, and there's a battle to be fought. And so Paul, at the end of the book of Ephesians, if you've been with us for a while, and I mean a while, we've been in the book of Ephesians for about a, a year and a half now, just kind of going verse by verse by verse. We're getting to the end, and at the end, Paul is like, by the way, we've talked about all these amazing themes, like who you are, and how to be united, and how to and how to be mature, and how to grow, and all these areas. And he's like, but before we're done, let's acknowledge we are on the edge of a battlefield. This is how you fight. We've already won, but this is how you fight. Okay. And so let's read it. Um, Let's read it. We've been here several times, but let's read it, and today we're going to finish this. Um, I'm going to spend some time reviewing, and then we're going to bring it home today. This is chapter 6, 10 through 18. This is... This is the word of God. Here we go. Ready? Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all to stand firm, stand therefore. Having fastened on the belt of truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness. And his shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Praying at all times in the spirit with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance making supplication for all the saints. Let's go back to the first paragraph. Paul says, finally, like last message, final thing, lock and load this, finally. And then he says, be strong. And here's what he doesn't say. He doesn't say, be strong in yourself because believe in yourself, buddy. You can do it. Like, like have positive, self-reflective psychobabble. That's not what he says, okay? He says, finally, Be strong, place of strength, source of strength. Be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. You stand in his strength. You stand in him. And then he names an enemy, okay? He says, for we do not battle against flesh and blood. The the enemy is not your spouse. The enemy is not your boss. The enemy is not um, the person in your life driving you crazy. He's like, you're not, you're not battling ultimately against them. But here's what he says. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. Okay? And we talked about this, but I hope you know this. But there is an enemy of your souls. The devil, or, or, or in Hebrew, the Satan, the Lucifer. Okay? He's the one who set himself up against God. And here's what Jesus calls him out and says, here's what you're trying to do. You're trying to steal, kill, and destroy. He said, you're you're a father of lies. Everything you speak is a lie, meaning the enemy wants to lie to you. He wants to steal, destroy your character, your marriage, your life, your reputation, you name it. He's, He's on this steal, kill, and destroy mission. Okay, and Paul says, like, we're not just wrestling against flesh and blood, but we are wrestling, and it's this, this word for this hand-to-hand combat against a, a demonic legion superstructure that's more than the eyes can see. If we could open our eyes in a spiritual reality sense, we would see, oh, angels, demons, God, Satan, a great big cosmic battle going on, okay? And again, let me just say this, we... Fight in victory, not for victory. But we're living until the day that Jesus comes again and we celebrate the ultimate victory. So Paul says, you stand against, important word, watch this, against the schemes 
of the devil. The schemes of the devil, that word schemes is a word something like the strategies or the blueprints or the, the satanic attacks to steal, kill, and destroy you. The lies that are coming at you, okay? He says, stand against the schemes of the devil. Um, I, w- I was even thinking last night um, as I was heavy with uh, the war in Israel and the, you know, the, I was watching um, and praying for the peace of Jerusalem like we're asked to do in scripture, okay? And, and the one article that encouraged me is, is as Iranian missiles and drones were, were going over into Israel that there was an article that said, but the Israel Defense Force in the United States knew it was coming, was prepared for it, and had counterattacks so that the majority of the drones and the missiles were shot down because the schemes of the enemy were identified and taken down, okay? And similarly, Paul is like, hey, you be on guard against the schemes of the enemy. And here's what he does, I think, in Ephesians 6. He looks left, right, 62 AD, he's in a Roman dungeon chained to these soldiers. And he's like, just like there is battle armor for a physical batter, there is spiritual armor that God gives us to stand against the schemes of the devil. And so here's what I'm going to do. Ready? I'm going to review a little bit by exposing scheme after scheme after scheme. And then we're going to move on uh, to the final pieces of armor. Okay, so as I kind of expose these, um, I would assume that many of these, um, this will be like, yeah, like I can relate to that, I can relate to that, I can relate to that. Because the enemy isn't trying anything new, all right? He's had his same strategy from the beginning of time. Okay, so here's scheme number one, right? If you're taking notes, scheme number one, lies, all right? He wants to lie to you. Okay, and therefore, verse 14, Paul says, Stand therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth. Let me review for a little bit. Ancient Roman armor, the belt was central to the armor. It held everything together, and not only that, not only did it sort of hold the armor together where you'd kind of fasten pieces of armor into the belt, but the belt is what identified you as a soldier. A Roman soldier would really never take it off even when their other armor wasn't on. They would wear their belt and when they would be in public, people would say, that identifies you as a soldier and watch this, very profound. It was known with that belt that they carried a delegated authority of the power of the emperor and the empire with them. It's like, you see the belt? Okay, he is identified as a soldier. There's authority behind it. This is who he is, and that piece of armor holds it all together. And Paul says, you take the belt of truth. Now, now the principal, absolute, inerrant source of truth in a believer's life is God's word, Okay. We are given the scriptures, okay? And we cling to it as an anchor. It says, all scripture is God-breathed. This is the very breath of God. It is, it's valuable to equip us, to empower us. It's, it's God's source of inerrant truth. And here's what it does, ready? Remember identity? Remember hold all the armor together, identity? It tells us what God believes is true. It tells us our identity, who we are, and how he sees us. It tells us our very identity so that when the lies, tell me if any of these kind of sound familiar to you, any of these enemies' lies. I feel like God is so distant. I feel like God is done with me. I feel like God doesn't care about me. I feel like God has abandoned me. I feel, I feel, I feel. We can cling to the very belt of truth and we can say, no, the scripture says, I will never leave you or forsake you. We can cling to, like I did this week, um, gosh, I feel a little distant from God. Scripture I, cling, I clung to, Romans chapter 8. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation will separate us from the love of God 
in Christ Jesus our Lord, to cling to, to truth. And so what does it mean to, to put on the armor? It means to realize, all right, there are going to be lies inflicted into your mind, like shot out at you like arrows, and to say, I'm clinging to scripture. I'm immersing myself in God's word. I am letting it be my anchor so I know who he is, how he sees me, what my identity is, what the authority of God is in and through me. I need a belt, all right? Because the schemes of the enemy is to lie to you. Does that make sense? All right. Let me give you another scheme. Not only do you need a belt, but here's a second scheme. Um, accusation. Scheme number two, accusation. And here's the verse. And having put on the breast plate of righteousness. Let me review a little bit. Um, ancient world battle scene, they wore a breastplate. Breastplate, not only did it like cover their vital organs, but in the ancient world mindset, it was your kind of this area that was the center of your feelings, okay? Your feelings and your emotions, all right? And here's a scheme of the enemy. He doesn't want this to be exposed. Here's a scheme of the enemy. He wants to lie to you and he wants to accuse you. He's been called the accuser of the brethren. He wants to accuse you, with ready? Guilt and shame, all right? Guilt and shame, that's his native language. So tell me if these things kind of sound familiar, okay? Tell me if you've heard these in your mind and heart. Look at what you've done. Look at your past. Look at your, look at your quiet thought life now. Look at your attitudes and your actions. And here it is, ready? Guilt and shame. You are not worthy of the battlefield. You are not a, a loved son or daughter of God. He's ashamed of you. You are, you are dirty before God. He loves to lie and heap on like guilt and shame and guilt and shame. And so here's what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to say, Daily, I will cling to a breastplate of righteousness. And, and I know we know this, but make a pastor's heart happy, okay? Is it our righteousness or the righteousness of Jesus? Please get this right. Thank you. It's the righteousness of Jesus, okay? It's the righteousness of Jesus. We are dressed in his righteousness alone faultless to stand before a throne, okay? Jesus died and he shed his blood that anybody who would believe, receive, and accept that free gift of his righteousness, our sins are forgiven, and before a holy God, we stand in his righteousness. Meaning when the enemy says, you are not good enough, like, like you've, you have not earned this, actually the right answer is, that's true, but I'm not standing on my righteousness, but on the righteousness of Jesus Christ. I cling to it before the throne of God that when God looks at me, he doesn't see my past, he doesn't see my sinfulness as, as the defining essence of my identity, he sees me in Christ. I'm forgiven because of Jesus. And when we sin, and please hear this, which we will, okay? When we Sin, here's what we're called to do, to bring it into the light, not to hide it, but to bring it into the light before God and others and to daily walk in the righteous cleansing of our daily reality which aligns with our eternal status. Is that too complex of a sentence? Okay, let me say it again. To live in this daily reality of forgiven and clean and in the light, which aligns with how God sees us as righteous before the throne of God. That means when the enemy is like, guilt, shame, you're not good enough, you're too dirty, you're wrong, we say, no, no, no. We are clinging to the righteousness eternally of Jesus, and we are living in the light in the daily, the righteousness of Jesus, like a breastplate that will define and protect your feelings, so you're not living in your own head, you're you're living in the righteousness of Christ. You put on a breastplate, all right? Scheme number three. I don't know if you experience this. I do often. Ready? Anxious and fearful thoughts. Anxious and fearful thoughts. Tell me if, tell me if this sounds like, like a temptation that you've walked in, okay? 
to hit us with the fear and anxiety of the unknown, the what ifs, the heartache and the frustrations of, will I have enough? Will I be enough? What about my future? What about my story? What about my children? What about, what about my retirement? What about financial anxiety, health anxiety? Will we have enough? Okay? And um, here's what he says. And his shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. Ancient world battle shoes um, were these sandal, nail-studded, Chaco Tiva-looking nails that held, here's the point, they would hold their ground in the midst of any attack, and they could walk over any terrain, okay? And Paul is like, yeah, here's, here's how the enemy will attack you. Here's his, here's his missile drone that he's shooting at you. Anxiety, fear, anxiety, fear. Anxiety, fear, and here's the counter strategy. Ready? The readiness given by the gospel of peace. This word peace, all throughout the scriptures, um, the Hebrew word shalom, and what it means, you know this, but sometimes we just need to keep saying what we know. Shalom means something like wholeness and rest and God's abundant perfection life and like, like this Whole, this balance, like shalom is this beautiful word. And basically what Paul is saying is the gospel, that Jesus died, rose, reigns, rules, walks with you now, lives in you now, is freeing you right now. There's a shalom that comes when we cling to the gospel and preach to our hearts the gospel and live in the reality of the gospel. There's this peace that, oh yeah, God reigns over this. He's coming again. He's alive and it causes you to be able to walk over the terrain like, what, what if I don't have enough money? I will never leave you or forsake you. I'm the God who owns a cattle on a thousand hills. I, will, I, I take care of the birds of the air and the lilies of the field. I'll take care of you. Don't be anxious about tomorrow. Will I be protected? You are more than conquerors. The gospel like, is like cling to the gospel. You can stand your ground. So, Here's what happens, ready? Here's daily life, ready? When you're starting to feel lies, you stop and you pray and you, and you immerse yourself in Scripture and you say, God, let me understand truth. When you're feeling guilt and shame, you stop and you say, God, let me focus my mind on your righteousness and cling to the fact that I'm righteous in you and confess anything that's in my life. When you're feeling anxious and fearful, here's what you do. You pause and you stop and you say, I remember the gospel. I remember the victory. I remember that he's coming. That is your counterattack when missiles are shot at you. Okay? The gospel of peace. Let me expose a fourth a scheme. Ready? Temptation. Scheme number four, temptation. Okay? And Paul says, in all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. Ancient world, flaming dart, dip it in tar, light it on fire, shoot it at you. It hits and it spreads a fire, okay? And so let me just kind of expose what temptation looks like, all right? Um, here's what the enemy wants to do. For example, he wants you to get offended at something. And that offense spreads a little bigger fire into bitterness which spreads a little bigger fire into anger, which spreads a little bigger fire into all-out fight. I don't know, like, can Ashley and I be real about the way we argue? I'm sure none of the rest of you do it like this, but here's, here's Ashley and I. Okay, ready? Like, we tend to, like, dang it, it's a little thing. Like, the enemy shot this little thing, and that offense can spread into a little bigger, and a little bigger, and suddenly we're angry, and suddenly we're fighting, and we look back when we're done, and we've made up, and we're like, that was so small. Why did we let it hit and spread and create maybe a bonfire that almost wrecked a whole day when it didn't need to, all right? The enemy wants to hit you with flaming arrows of offense to cause you to be bitter, to cause you to be angry, to burn down your weak, if he can, all right? Or let's talk about 
sexual temptation, okay? Here's what the enemy would love to do. Have you cross a boundary, maybe, maybe online, maybe in social media, maybe something that you know that you shouldn't look at, and his goal is not just that, it's to hit spread, 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 spread. It's to cause you to have maybe a, a flirtatious conversation with someone at work that seems harmless, blah, blah, blah. That's not his end goal. It's to hit spread, 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 fire. All right? That's the way the enemy works with sexual temptation. Uh, that's the way the enemy works with all of his strategies, frankly. Okay? Um, how about gossip, for example? Like that, whatever that word is, like that slight, I don't know, satisfaction, fake satisfaction you get from, did you hear about this person, blah, blah, blah. He wants to spread it into a burning bonfire, okay? And here's what Paul says. You take up a shield of faith, ancient world, two long um, wooden uh, post things, four and a half by two and a half, surrounded by leather, linen, and these iron clasps. And here's the key. It was soaked in a basin of water. So a water-saturated shield would extinguish flaming arrows. And Paul says, you take a shield of faith. Meaning, I just love the, the image, like Jesus is the source of living water. And you with faith, which is something like trust, dependence, obedience, I'm going to be sure of something that I cannot fully see in the middle of this moment where I'm being tempted and there's like drone flying, missile flying at me to get me tempted to spread a fire. I pause and I have to say, Jesus, in faith, I'm looking to you. I'm depending on you. I'm trusting you. I'm going to obey you. The key to you like winning the battle of porn is not just like Internet filters and accountability groups, though those are needed, the key in that moment is to turn your heart and life to Jesus and to say, I need to depend on you to give me strength to overcome something that in my own flesh I can overcome. All right? The key to you not living in constant arguments with people in your life is to turn to Jesus and to depend on him, lean into him, like trust in him. All right? A shield of faith, all right? And now um, I want to just move on with, with the next two pieces of armor that will finish it off, okay? Look at verse 17. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Helmet of salvation, sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, Okay, we're going to look at two different swords in this teaching. Uh, one is defense, one is offense. Um, he says, take the helmet of salvation. So if you're taking notes, um, I want to expose a scheme that I, I go through. I think many of you probably go through too. A scheme of discouragement. Can I have number five? discouragement. Okay. Take the helmet of salvation. Okay. So let me just tell you about a helmet and then I'll get into discouragement. A soldier would wear a helmet to the battlefield. It was an iron looking helmet with these weird looking cheek hanging down things to protect your face. Um, and you'd wear a helmet mostly to protect yourself against the broadsword. Broadsword was a long double-edged sword that the cavalry, soldiers in the cavalry would use. And, and the kind of the purpose of the broadsword wasn't just to like, you know, I don't know, chop you down or something. It was actually to crush your skull. It was a crushing blow with a broadsword which would immobilize you on the battlefield. It would knock you down and, and leave you sort of locked down and immobilized on the battlefield, unable to battle. Um, and I don't know about you, but I think the enemy often wants to attack me and others with discouragement. And, and what, what is that? Um, I think that's something happens in your life, like something's mysterious or frustrating, or it's not according to the plan, or there's something of heartache, or there's something of um, 
I don't know, just the annoying things in life. And the enemy likes to take that and sort of capture onto that and overwhelm you with just this wave of discouragement, just this wave of I'm paused, I'm locked down, I'm immobilized, if you will. He wants to take the, the messy, frustrating things of life and take an evil, satanic twist to like make you like down on the battlefield, all right? Um, so what does it mean to say a helmet of salvation? Okay, um, I need to, I need to um, unpack the word salvation. Okay, so I'm, I'm going to go into some uh, deeper end of the swimming pool in theology a little bit. Okay, are you, are you with me? I need you to put your like, big, deep thinking attention spans on, okay? Everybody good? Everybody ready? All right. When the Bible uses the word salvation, it uses it in three senses, okay? Three senses. Justification, sanctification, and glorification, okay? It uses the word saved, like you've been saved, justified, saved, you're being sanctified, saved, you will be glorified. Let me just give you some definitions. Justification is I have been saved from the penalty of sin. Sanctification is present tense. I'm being saved from the power of sin in my life. And glorification is I will one day, future tense, be saved from even the presence of sin when I'm rescued ultimately in heaven. Okay? Bible uses verses in all three. Okay, so justification. So let me just explain this. Here's what it is in its essence. Ready? There is a penalty of sin. When we sin before a holy God, there is a penalty of that sin. The penalty of sin is death and separation. But Jesus said, I am paying the penalty for your sin. So that in a very legal, spiritually legal sense, anybody who believes in Jesus and receives that gift of forgiveness, here's what happens before a holy God and a holy judge, okay? The penalty of sin is taken and dealt with on the cross, and the righteousness of Jesus is transferred onto our lives. So before a holy God, we can say, I have been saved, meaning I am justified, meaning there's nothing I can earn, there's nothing I can work for, there's nothing I can do. He did it. He paid for it. I receive a gift, and before a holy God, I am seen as clean. Do you see that? Okay, so what, how does that work itself out in this, okay? When we are tempted with discouragement, like this flaming arrow of discouragement, ultimately, here, here's what God would intend us to do, to pause in that moment and remember, oh, even though I feel weighted down by something, the ultimate weight of my sin has been dealt with on the cross, and I'm free and clean before a holy God. Like I'm, I'm living as an innocent man. And when I can do that, all right, it lifts my spirits up. All right, I've been justified, okay? Sanctified, all right? That's his, remember Easter sermon? I was talking about how like you clamp down, you chain down a tractor, and, and it's chained down until you break the power of that chain. Do you guys remember this? It was like three weeks ago. You yeah, everybody with me? Okay, good. Um, it's chained down, and then the power of the chains are broken until you, and then you have to just like peel off the little pieces of those chains, okay? Paul says in Ephesians chapter 4 that he uses this analogy to say, you have been given this new life. Peel off your grave clothes. Put on the newness of life. And let Jesus work his salvation in you, meaning you've been declared holy and he's making you live out the holiness that you would look like Christ, okay? So when you're feeling discouraged, like when you're feeling down and weighted down, part of what God wants you to do is say, I cling to this salvation, God, even if I don't understand the mystery, even if I don't even understand what you're doing or your pace, God, you are working out this salvation, this sanctifying, this making me look like Christ, and I trust you. Okay, and it can lift you out of discouragement. And then finally, glorification. Okay, here's the third and last one, glorification. 
one day we will ultimately be saved. Meaning, I hope this isn't new news for you. If it is, it'll be very encouraging to you. Ready? Here we go. Jesus is coming again. This life is not all there is. In fact, this life is said biblically to be short and like a breath. And one day, clouds will part. Jesus will come. He's taking you home. And sin, suffering, shame, pain, death will be no more because his kingdom, and it's not like, by the way, I hope, let me just dispel some bad theology. He doesn't hit the red button and explode earth and we float off to heaven. That's not what happens. That's not what happens. The new Jerusalem, the kingdom of heaven comes down on earth and he makes all things new. No sin, shame, Eden is restored. We will be saved. And here's what we're supposed to do. Ready? Here's why Paul says you put on a helmet of salvation when you're weighted down in, in the temporary earth frustration, disillusionment. Like, what are you doing, God? You can pause and remember, oh yeah, this life is short. He's making all things new. He's coming again. Recently, I, I have somebody close to me in my life who, um, who I just love this person. And this person is struggling with this mystery. And I, I was talking to this other pastor and I was like, I don't even know how to pray for him. Like, I, I, don't, I don't know how to pray exactly, like the words that I should pray for him. And this other pastor told me, he's like, he's a follower of Jesus. Thank the Lord for his salvation. Thank the Lord that this time is short and he's coming again. Thank the Lord and strap on this helmet of salvation. And it was like, oh yes, let that be my first prayer for this person struggling in mystery. Thank you, Lord, that he's saved. When you are feeling discouragement, you cling to a helmet of salvation. Does that make sense? Okay. Every piece of armor that we've given so far has been defensive in nature. But then watch what Jesus does. Watch what Paul does. Verse 17, can I have it on the screen? Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. The sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Paul says, but you have been given an offensive weapon. The sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. This word sword is different from the broad sword. This word sword is uh, the Greek word makaira, and it's the word for this 12 to 18 inch dagger, okay? It's this, this sword that was used to inflict like wounds and to block like the enemy's blows, okay? It was a makaira sword. And he said, the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Now, can we talk about the word word for a moment? Can we talk about that? Okay, um, important word is the word word throughout the Bible, okay? Um, two ancient words for that. The first one is the word logos, or logos. The second is the word rhema, okay? Logos, let me give you a definition. Um, it means the written word, okay? It's also used for Jesus. He is the logos. It's, it's a word that means something like the reasoning or the logic or, or the divine mindset. And it's used for the written word, like, like God's word, okay? When we, often when we talk about the word of God, we're intuitively saying logos, okay? But there's another word, which is the word here. It's the word rhema. And rhema, if this is the written word, uh, the word rhema literally means the spoken word, okay? And so let me give you Strong's definition. Strong is, writes this big concordance with all these definitions. And Strong's definition, I love it. That which is uttered by the living voice. Let me say that again that which is spoken or uttered by the living voice. Okay, so 471 times in the Old Testament, um, we see this word rhema lived out. And it's something like um, the word of the Lord came to Jonah. It's not like Jonah read a scroll. It was like the living God showed up and said, go to Nineveh. Like, like it is the word of the Lord spoken. Okay, 68 times in the New Testament. Um, and so if I were to give you a definition, it's something like when the living voice of God's word becomes a spirit sword for a now battle moment. 
okay? So let, let me just give you some examples. Okay, so Jesus is in the wilderness, and he's being tempted by the enemy. And, and the enemy is like, hey, how about this? How about this? How about this? He's like, he's like, hey, how about you make those stones into bread? And Jesus takes out his now moment living voice battle word. He's like, block, block, inflict, inflict. It is written, man shall not live by bread alone. And something about the spoken word of God's living voice is like a weapon that neutralizes the enemy. All right? A while ago, uh, Ryan Massey was speaking on this, and he said there's times where he feels like, like overwhelming fear. And, and what he does is he speaks out, literally speaks out loud, God, you have not given me a spirit of fear but of power, of love, and of self-discipline. And speaking out God's word, is, it's, as if, it's as if something lifts, he said. I think that's beautiful. Um, Ashley and I are often praying for our sons, and we're saying, Lord, what is, what is like a weapon word, a now word? What are you speaking for them that we can share with them now? Um, and so sometimes, even this morning, like I'll, I'll text my son. My son is in, um, you know, Division One lacrosse in this very intense. It's like such a intense environment, and and I'm often just saying, "Hey, this is a word that I have on my heart. This is a verse that I think is for you. Uh, be strong and courageous. Be strong and courageous." The other day, um, Martha Pollock. I asked her if I could share this. Um, if you haven't had Martha Pollock in our church, pray for you. Um, you, you might just be missing something because God uses her um, in profound ways. And she goes, and she was like, I was praying for Caleb, and this is what I had well up in my heart, the word seeds and light. And I believe, and she wrote out this long thing saying, Caleb, when you're on the lacrosse field, there are seeds being planted that you do not see for a harvest that will one day be experienced. And there's a light shining out into the darkness, seeds and light. And he took those words, like, like weapon words, that he would take them and use them for encouragement. Seeds and light, seeds and light, okay? The living voice speaks. Can I tell you one of the clearest ways I know the living voice speaks? And, and he probably does this to you on a pretty daily basis. This last week, um, I was having this one conversation, and I was talking about this other guy that I'd met a few years ago, kind of this funny, jovial guy. And I was describing him to someone else, and I exaggerated a little bit. I kind of exaggerated the story that I was telling of this guy. And you want to know what the living voice did to Pastor David in his heart? Quickly, cleanly, convicted me. I felt the living voice speak to my spirit and say, hey, pause, you're stepping out of righteousness now. All right? And what do I do? I... I Hold that under God's word. Yes, I exaggerate. I was wrong. I confess. I come in to the light. But what it takes is this daily walking and listening and talking with the spirit of the living God so that you would hear the living voice to be used as a weapon, okay, against the enemy's schemes, the rhema of God, okay? The logos, the rhema, all right? And then he closes this with our final verse, and then, and then we're done. He says this, not only a helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, but he says, and I want you to hear what word kind of comes out most. He says, praying at all times in the Spirit, with all prayer and supplication, to that end keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. What's the word that you hear most common there? Thank you. Paul's like, there's this constancy. There's this continual prayer. It's, it's as if Paul is saying, you want to be on the battlefield? You want to live and thrive in the midst of war? You need to have this flowing conversation with the Holy Spirit. You need to have a heart of prayer. That's how you discern in the moment. Wait a second, this is, this is, this is shame and guilt. God, let me cling to your righteousness. Wait a second. Is this true? Is this what you say of me, God? Open up God's word. God, show me. Yes, I need a belt of truth. I'm being 
tempted. It's like coming like a flaming arrow. God, in prayer, I'm taking up a shield of faith. John Piper says it is the oxygen for the battlefield. You breathe on the battlefield by speaking to the Lord, by praying for others, by asking the Lord. It's a continual conversation with the Lord. All right? So worship team, would you come on up, and um, I'm going to bring us into communion. Um, and as I do, I just want to just want to point out one final thing, okay? One final thing for our hearts. Um, I've shown you a lot of armor, right? Like a shield and a breastplate and a helmet and shoes and a sword. And so here's the question I always love to ask as we're closing the armor of God. Um, what is the piece of armor that you see for the back? You see any armor for the back? Yeah, there's no heads nodding yes because there is no armor for the back. Um, why? Well, first, I think, because we don't need to retreat. We, we fight for victory, from victory. Number two, very profound to me, um, in the ancient Roman warfare, um, there was one major rule for battle, and that is you fought together. You didn't, you didn't fight alone. You fought shield to shield together. Um, and a lone soldier was considered a dead soldier. But the marching Roman legion, shield to shield, marching together was considered invincible. All right? We need the church. Do you know that? You need fellow followers of Jesus in your life. You need men, you need shield to shield marching with other guys. Ladies, you need other ladies in your life walking with you. You don't, you don't do this battle alone. You do this battle with the body of Christ, with the family of God. That's what we're called. Please don't accept the modern nonsense lie that it can be just your personal relationship with Jesus, just you and Jesus, and you're good. You don't need the church. Like, we've walked with people all the time like that. You know what? Their lives start to train wreck when they do their life alone. Okay? You need the church. All right. But with your brothers and sisters by your side, with armor strapped on, one day Jesus is coming again, and we will celebrate the victory. We're in between D-Day and V-E Day. And the victory was won um, with the death and resurrection of Jesus. The night before he was crucified, he took bread and broke it. He took wine and he poured it, and he said, this is my body. It'll be broken for you and poured out for you with this Salvation will be sealed, all right? And we, we take these elements to remember that. And we take these elements to have this time of like humbling ourselves, examining ourselves and saying, God, anything in our life not pleasing to you, we submit it to you. Um, so I just invite you into that. If you're a follower of Jesus, take some time. Um, humble yourself. Uh, speak to the Lord. Examine your heart. And then it like... In a spirit of victory, come on up and take communion and remember what he's done, okay? Let me pray for us, and then um, spend some time with the Lord, and when the moment's right, come on up, and we'll worship to close the service. Jesus, we love you. Thank you for your body and your blood. Thank you that your sacrifice won the victory. Thank you that you're coming again, and we get to take this meal to symbolize that the story is not done and our Savior is coming. We love you, Jesus. It's in your name we pray. Amen. When the moment's right, come on up and take communion, and we'll close in worship.